So while we are waiting for you guys to enter the, uh, uh, your questions so we can discuss this, I'm going to start with our first speaker, Dr. Nick Bakar, who is here, who presented uh, a leading uh, talk on calciphylaxis. Uh, so let's start with this, the keyword warfare, right? It's, uh, it's uh, one of those uh, heartbreaking stories in nephrology, among others. A lot of our patients have cardiovascular disease, and many of them, oh, thank you. Many of them are uh, where used to be, at least until recently, on, on warfarin. And uh, I, wow, I can't see myself. I noticed that my tie wasn't in good shape. Okay, I apologize for that. So thank you very much. So, so going back to the keyword warfarin, so we started in our dialysis centers to, to essentially discontinue warfarin on many patients. Is this what you are going to recommend? Yeah. That's a great question, and um, uh, of course, uh, you, you can address that uh, 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 in, I guess, at least two different ways. One is, of course, for individuals uh, who are on dialysis and have now been diagnosed or have suspected to have uh, uremic calciphylaxis, um, I think it is uh, very reasonable to discontinue warfarin. Of course, the question becomes, uh, what if the patient has a strong indication for ongoing anticoagulation, what can I do? And I have some pearls. None of this is, again, um, uh, proven, but I think some rational uh, approach will be something like if the indication for anticoagulation was non-valvular AFib, and if the patient has really high risk for a stroke type kind of complication, then I think probably apixaban will be the most appropriate agent. You can dose it based on two out of three factorial design in the sense if the patient is less than 60 years of age, um, um, uh, sorry, if the patient is less than 80 years of age and uh, weighs more than 60 kilos and is on dialysis, you can go with uh, uh, 2.5 milli uh, 5 milligrams PID, whereas if the patient is uh, more than 80 years of age or weighs less than 60 kilograms, you go with 2.5 milligram PID. If the indication was um, uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or some kind of other hyper coagulable condition. I don't think so. The novel agents have been studied in that regard. So I guess in our center, we are going with uh, uh, enoxaparin injections uh, for that patient. What if the indication was a mechanical heart valve? Again, in that setting, we are going with uh, enoxaparin uh, uh, subcutaneous injections. But I guess a bigger question before uh, this calciphylaxis uh, uh, patient question is what should we do with anticoagulation in general among dialysis patients, particularly if they're there for a common indication such as uh, AFib? And I think the data on that are quite uh, 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 are, are debatable. Uh, on one hand, maybe we should not anticoagulate them at all because they have, uh, uh, they are a little bit uh, uh, physiologically, so as to say, anticoagulated. The risk of stroke uh, is higher, but the risk of bleeding is also high. Uh, so there is a lot of debate on this. But I guess if you have made the decision to initiate anticoagulation. I don't think so. I will choose an agent, warfarin versus no warfarin, purely based on the individual risk of calciphylaxis. Because again, in the bigger scheme of things, this is a relatively rare complication. But of course, if the patient has heavy burden of vascular calcification or previous history of calciphylaxis, uh, then I guess I would probably choose a non-vitamin K antagonist agent such as um, apixaban for a dialysis patient. Yeah, that's what, uh, thank you very much. That's what a lot of colleagues have been doing. Uh, the next question, Dr. Ko, is the hypopigmented area over the uh, AV fistula graft a warning sign or innocent? <laughs> Since you, one of your slides was that. <clears throat> uh, so it's just an indication that the, the especially, you know, I highly recommend the dialysis staff to measure the size of the aneurysm, and you can measure the size of the hypopigmented area. If it's growing faster, uh, if you notice that the whitish discoloration and the aneurysm itself is growing rapidly, um, that's a, that is an indication that you need to send that patient to a vascular expert. So if they even have that hypopigmentation and you're just meeting this patient for the first time, I would have them go and see somebody just to make sure, because it's a sign that there's something that's causing that fistula to, usually it's a sign that the, there's um, advanced growth of that aneurysm. Great, thank you. So we're going to pay more attention on that from now on. Uh, Dr. Uh, Stevens, uh, is the, uh, 
actually the, the, the hyper or small or smallerity or hyper or smaller approach in our neurosis is called permissive hypernatremia. Is this, should this generally be uh, implemented on all neuro ICU patients on dialysis? Oh. oh, can you hear me? That is a question I always defer to the neurointensivist for. So whenever we have a patient that we're starting either CRT or starting their HD on and they've, they're in the neuro ICU or on the neuro floor, if they were admitted for an intracranial emergency, then the first thing we do before we think about our prescription is to ask the neurointensivist or the neurology team if they're going to have a specific goal. Um, I am not trained in neurointensive uh, critical care, so they are basing it off of the interval change in edema on the CTs, uh, on interval CTs. So if there's someone I'm concerned about, I may weigh in on my opinion, but I wouldn't say it's a blanket statement for every dialysis patient. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tang, uh, I'm going to start with also my own question about dialysis adequacy that came on top of the, uh, uh, a lot of things that patients prefer. I, I, I always uh, uh, made a question uh, or raised a question about uh, that uh, because I thought that even for, uh, for our patients, that, that's not as important as fatigue and, and ability to travel and other things. Was there any reason maybe the, the session was redirected uh, or the discussion was directed towards certain uh, areas that patients chose that adequacy as one of the top uh, priorities, or what, how do you explain that, given that patient may not even feel similar to phosphorus numbers or, or other numbers, may not feel, may, may not quite understand what it means? Yeah, it was very interesting because in the process, um, in terms of dialysis adequacy, it was rated quite high in the Delphi by patients, and we were surprised to see that as well. But when we delved further into the comments and also the discussion at the workshop, the definition of dialysis adequacy is very different to how health professionals may define it. So it was conflated with the issues related to quality of life, which is why it brought the priority for dialysis adequacy higher. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, I'm going to start another round, and in between, please, uh, uh, if you have any uh, uh, also more interactive question you would like to uh, uh, hear, ask the question directly, please uh, uh, feel free to interrupt me. So going back to Dr. Negwakar, the question is, did, did the use of loop diuretics uh, along with vitamin K antagonists uh, uh, have exacerbating effects on calciphylaxis? Um, loop diuretics, is that the question? Yeah. yeah. So, so it's interesting. Um, loop diuretics and warfarin. Um, I'm not sure what the premise for that question is, but uh, as far as I know, there is no at least documented link between diuretic agents and the risk of calcification or calciphylaxis, either in the context of warfarin or no warfarin. We have looked at the uh, loop diuretic as one of the uh, potential exposures when we, do, when we did our uh, analysis of non-uremic patients, and in fact these patients had completely normal kidney function but had developed calciphylaxis. And I, if I remember correctly, I don't think so that was one of, that was a statistically significant um, association, so we did not see that. Great, uh, thank you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure uh, if there was maybe observation of one of uh, our colleagues about using uh, furosemide and warfarin. Uh, question for Dr. Ko, uh, should we tolerate uh, still syndrome when patient has sporadic pain in the hand during dialysis? And, uh, and nothing, I add nothing beyond those symptoms except for a little bit of pain towards the end of dialysis and that's it usually, when, and, and I can relate to that actually. Some, some of my patients have that, so to, at the, uh, hour three or four, it becomes numb and, and I have some pain, and then we say, okay, otherwise it's, everything's fine. I actually advocate conservative therapy first, and um, you know, some patients can't get the banding, it just depends on if there's a significant calcification in the wall, if it's really hard, if, if, the soft, if the, there's a lot of scarring in that area, the patient has a lot of keloid formation, the fistula is significantly aneurysmal and the patient has to get surgery. So as an interventionalist, 
I, uh, when I see patients, and often I see a, a lot of patients with steel syndrome, is if they can tolerate it, and I say, if you can live with it, if you can wear a warm glove, if you can order that little box on Amazon that looks like a cell phone and it's a hand warmer and you can hold on to that at dialysis and you can live with that, then let's not do surgery. Let's not be invasive and, and cut down and do this. And, uh, and let's see how you tolerate that. And most patients, I say, want to try the conservative therapy first. Well, great. Uh, thank you. Sometimes, actually, it, maybe at, if it gets worse over time as the pain and numbness, maybe then we refer back patient to you guys, right? But uh, thank you. Question for Dr. Stevens. Uh, uh, what to do if patient who has a first-time seizure during dialysis? Uh, essentially, that's the question. If, wow. Uh, that happened to me twice, and I called 911. That's the answer for those who are in the U.S. But they're asking you what to do. Is there a role? for blood volume monitoring in neurocritical patients on a CRT? So I guess that was two questions. So is the first question, I guess the first question is so for pa a patient start. suddenly seizes during the dialysis, your dialysis is around. So you're going to car and driving back and suddenly it says, oh, guess what? Your patient is uh, seizing. Yeah, for a new start patient, that would raise suspicion for dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. If someone's well dialyzed, it would raise suspicion that either we missed that they were on an antiepileptic that needed to be redosed or that something else was going on. I think DDS would be unlikely in someone who's uh, established on a dialysis program. So my suspicion would be different depending on if it's a new start or an established patient. If, um, and then the second part was. The second one is, is, is there a role for uh, volume monitoring in neurocritical patients on CRT. So I, we have a lot of uh, patients on CRT. So essentially, if they, they are in, in uh, neuro ICU with uh, probably intracranial bleeding or subdural or, or other things, is there a role for b blood volume monitoring? Now, I, I guess also we, are, we may ex expand these to crit lines and other things. Yeah, um, I think there are two aspects you could look at, either crit lines or something like NICOM. We don't use either of those um, at Columbia. I know the crit line is uh, controversial right now. We uh, are able to use it in, in particular patients where their volume status is very challenging. It's mostly used in our pediatric program. So we don't, we don't conventionally use crit line monitoring, uh, even in the ICUs. And then NICOM, we also don't really use for cardiac output, real-time cardiac output monitoring for these patients. So no, it's, we really leave it up to the ICU nurses for the minute-to-minute -minute assessment of uh, human index stability and how they're tolerating the UF rate. Great. For uh, CRT, for HD, it would be our own dialysis nurses. Thank you. And any comments on that, whoever raised that question? Um, Dr. Tong, uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, essentially, the, the, is, is, is there a role for symptom management in ICU? I'm, I'm sorry, in dialysis. I'm going to expand on this. Why nephrologists fail to do this? I, I'm part of a, a panel, U.S. government panel, uh, which is nursing sciences. Uh, probably as one of very few nephrologists in the U.S. Uh, uh, being part of that panel, everybody else uh, is nurses. And I see a lot of grant applications coming from all over the places, heart failure, symptom management in heart failure, symptom management in COPD. I yet have to see one of those symptom management in dialysis or advanced CKD. Since you have had a lot of interactions, why do you think we don't have that field while it's uh, relatively common in non-nephrology areas, in cardiology and maybe other places you have dealt with? I agree that symptom management is really complicated and I think nephrology does lag behind and for multiple reasons. First, I think the, in terms of the symptoms, the causes are so multifactorial and complex, particularly in the dialysis population. Second, we don't have very good measures to measure symptoms as yet. Um, and also, but I think that the tide has shifted. I think there is increasing focus on symptoms now, um, particularly with this um, increasing recognition to deliver patient-centered care. Mm -hmm. So I have actually seen an increasing number of grant applications get funded. So an example is the SWIFT trial. So uh, symptom monitoring embedded in a registry to monitor and assess and address uh, symptoms in patients. Um, and also an increase interest in, uh, I guess, lifestyle trials 
to try and improve symptoms. I, I think we do have a long way to go, but I, I also think that there is some progress being made in nephrology. Yeah, actually, thank uh, to pioneers like yourself that uh, was a, a wake-up call to our field. That means we nephrologists, I, should, I shouldn't say we, maybe I nephrologists, just uh, my goal was until recently just to say it's time for you to start dialysis, go and place that vascular access. No, I don't want it. I'm going to convince you. And uh, then not infrequently when in last few years I connected to patients' groups, they're telling me that dialysis worsened their life. They, they didn't have cramps. Now they have cramps. They didn't have pain of uh, the needle. They have pain. So, and, and they tell other patients, don't ever start dialysis on, uh, on top of so many other problems. And just now, to add, I think in the context of nephrology, patients are quite fearful of jeopardizing their long-term relationships with providers, so they may not feel as, um, you know, safe or confident to express the issues with symptoms and, and dialysis. Uh, th thank you very much again. The, now, one of the things we have done is twice weekly dialysis. Uh, the UCI model of twice weekly dialysis, we started five years ago, and it's now all over the country and beyond. And many patients are happy with less dialysis, at, especially at the start. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, since you said freedom, dialysis freedom, more weekend, it was quite interesting. You said patients appreciated two days instead of one day between two dialysis sessions. That's actually what we do it with, uh, according to the UCI model. So have you had those talks given, notwithstanding that uh, in probably Australia, like in Western Europe, twice weekly dialysis is a taboo? Yeah, so there's, um, I think there's a trial that's about to start up called the INCH trial, so that's incremental dialysis, so not starting straight away on the standard three times a week dialysis. And I think there has been some kind of shifts in thinking around dialysis prescription uh, in consideration of this dialysis priority for dialysis free time. And it's interesting because we also ask patients, well, what, how, like, what reduction in time is important to you? And we said, is it you know, one hour? Is it two hours? And they were saying, you know, even a minute less dialysis would yeah. be really important to me. Uh, amazing. Any comments or questions by colleagues? So think about this, and uh, uh, we still have uh, seven minutes. I'm going to move on to Dr. Nigwekar. Uh, sodium thiosulfate should not be used, and I'm going to also editorials that I just started two patients on sodium thiosulfate last week and last month, one in December and one last week. And, and uh, I just don't feel comfortable not giving something because then they're gonna look at me and say, look, I'm losing my, uh, my, uh, my upper leg or lower leg and you're not doing even anything. So sh what should we do? Yeah, great question, um, and uh, just a quick uh, plug-in. I mean, those patients that you have recently uh, diagnosed and started on treatments, uh, uh, please do refer them to our registry. We'll be happy to see if we can uh, recruit them and follow some uh, follow them longitudinally as part of our research study. But I guess your question is is right on point. Here we are. Um, in uh, 2020 uh, for a rare disease of calcifolaxis described initially in 1960s, uh, but we don't have any approved treatment, but what the, one of the most commonly described off-label treatments is indeed uh, sodium thiosulfate, which is otherwise approved by the FDA to treat cyanide toxicity. Nothing to do with vascular calcification or calcifolaxis. It has made its way into the literature based on uh, case reports, case series, and some of the data that I presented. But I guess, so clinically, what do you do? Uh, I'm not, of course, uh, saying that uh, 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 this treatment does not work, uh, but all I'm saying is we don't know whether it works or not. So if it is, it's going to be the practicing clinician's judgment in discussion with the patients and their caregivers that you want to uh, initiate this treatment. Obviously, we don't want to set up high expectations saying that this is going to cure your condition because we don't have data to support that. Um, <clears throat> and I think we should be aware of the side effects, so nausea, vomiting, which is 20, 25% of the patients develop this, uh, hypocalcemia, metabolic acidosis uh, with increased anion gap, uh, QTC prolongation, vol volume overload. What I have seen clinically, and this is again clinical observation at this point, not uh, uh, part of our clinical trial program, but anecdotally what I've seen is for patients who we initiate on intravenous thiosulfate, and if they report like at two or three week treatment point that there is some improvement in the pain intensity 
mm-hmm. calciphylaxis associated pain intensity that's the patient that i feel eventually is going to respond to this therapy in terms of lesion resolution or in terms of uh, subsequent uh, complete cure so as to say of calciphylaxis but if that initial response is not there then i'm less enthusiastic to keep pushing this therapy beyond that considering the side effects and other issues that i mentioned and i think in the clinical trial just to bring this home with uh, with the song initiative and also yesterday's debate between the 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 patient oriented outcomes versus uh, other uh, physician oriented outcomes uh, in the clinical trial the calista trial the sodium thiosulfate trial we actually convinced the fda to use calciphylaxis associated pain intensity as the primary endpoint so the trial is approved for that uh, that endpoint so i think there is a synergy here in terms of bringing the patient oriented outcomes Great. and that will have implications for Th- thank you any comments any burning uh, comments or relevant comments about sodium thiosulfate john So this is, a, again, for those who don't know uh, our legend, Dr. John Dagirdas, uh, my, yeah, they know me. My, my role model. And, and uh, uh, so, yeah. so it, it, the key point, the key word is t- sodium thiosulfate. So yeah, this is uh, an alternative. Uh, Sagar, we've had this discussion. You know, I'm, I'm a magnesium monomaniac. But what, what was interesting to me the idea is, for those who don't know, magnesium is an anti-calcification factor. So when they list all the else, anti-calcification factors, magnesium is one of them. And uh, I was long suspected that maybe magnesium has something to do with this. There's a couple of things you showed that maybe I selectively looked at your slides. I was very interested in the very low incidence of, um, of um, calciphylaxis in Japan. Now, in Japan, the magnesium levels are substantially higher than in U.S. dialysis patients. And I don't know whether they eat seaweed or what they're eating, but whatever they're eating in their diet, their magnesium levels are substantially higher. And I was just doing some literature searches. There's there's actually some people looked at Fournier's gangrene, which is related to calciphylaxis, you know, uh, being related to uh, low serum magnesium. So I was just wondering, you had the database and uh, you noticed, I noticed when you mentioned the European database that you were looking at magnesium. Has anybody looked at magnesium in terms of pay, as a risk factor? And the other thing I was thinking about is the increase in um, prevalence in the US. Uh, has anyone looked at whether this parallels the increase with omeprazole and whether, which of course can lower magnesium? And did anybody look at uh, omeprazole as a risk factor for, uh, for calciphylaxis? Yeah, those are great, um, great questions, and I think um, uh, uh, starting with the sodium thiosulfate, I think if this agent, let's say if it does truly has efficacy as a treatment agent for calciphylaxis, likely the way I, at least I envision the calciphylaxis treatment, it's going to be multiple agents combined, and one of the, some of the other components may be something uh, like magnesium. In fact, the BEAT calciphylaxis trial that I briefly mentioned that was initiated by Meg Jardine and her group in Australia uh, is trying magnesium as one of the interventions in their trial that has a smart design. So they have three intervention arms, sodium thiosulfate, phytonadione, and magnesium. Patients will start with one. If they do well on that, they will continue on that. If they don't do well, they'll be switched to the second uh, option, which can be magnesium or vitamin K if they're already on thiosulfate. And, and so, any comments on PPI? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Uh, as far as I know, nobody has looked into that uh, specific uh, association. We tried to look into the serum magnesium levels in our case control study that we did with Fresenius collaboration, but not many individuals had the magnesium levels measured in the dialysis setting. But in the registry that we are building up now, we are collecting bio samples, and we will be able to measure uh, magnesium levels. It would be interesting. So Dr. Koh, uh, something, uh, if a patient needs uh, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, needs uh, CRT, uh, can AV fistula be used? Uh, so that's also maybe uh, Dr. Simmons can comment after Dr. Cole because not infrequently these patients who require CRT are dialysis patients. They have AV fistula, but CRT that means 24/7 dialysis. Sometimes I call it a, yeah, it's 24/7 hemofiltration in ICU. Usually we have to place a catheter. We say that you can use AV fistula 24/7, especially with low blood flow. And that has become one of my challenges. Last week in, in neuro ICU and other ICUs, 
I had to place a, a catheter on two patients because they, these are dialysis patients with well-functioning AV fistula. Do you think we can shift the paradigm and say Dr. Koi allowed us today to use AV fistula for CRT? Um, I'm sorry, can you? No, CRT essentially means that uh, hemodia filtration in the ICU for patients who have low blood pressure or hemodynamic not stable. And uh, if this is a dialysis patient with AV fistula, we still place a catheter uh, and, and a non-tunnel catheter to do the uh, 24-7 dialysis, which is mostly hemofiltration. Uh, and, and we shy away from using AV fistula, right? For it has been traditional, and, and the question is also the, the, about this. Uh, and I think, uh, so probably, you, don't, you haven't heard of that, right? If AV fistula can be used 24 hours every day with low blood flow. Boy, geez, that's, uh, <laughs> that's kind of beyond my expertise, and I can't even imagine a 24-hour use. That's, um, I'm going to have to defer to. I, I can try and answer, but my answer is also <laughs> limited to my experience. So in our, my experience... We have two concerns uh, with, doing, with using the AV fistula for 24-hour uh, modalities. The first is thrombosis, yeah. uh, if you have the needles in for that long. Again, I don't have any anecdotal experience about whether that happens because we don't do it. The second, and I, I imagine that's where this that's concern question, comes yeah. from. The second is um, if you have an access cannulated for a prolonged amount of time, I mean, the safest thing to have is a dialysis nurse present when there's a large needle and a fistula. Our prolonged or our 24-hour therapies uh, are administered by ICU-trained nurses, not by dialysis nurses. So the second concern that we have in particular, in addition to thrombosis, is is there a nurse at the bedside who could deal with an emergency if the needles dislodge, if something happens to the circuit? Yeah, I guess uh, we, you just heard that still nobody feels comfortable to endorse that. And uh, we continue to preserve AV fistula when patient is in ICU and need CRT. So both of our experts uh, had major reservation on that, right? And the last question, we, we're, we're running out of time, but we, you have a 30 minute break right now after this. But the last question for Dr. Tong, and I'm going to expand on this question because the palliative medicine in nephrology sometimes comes in, in, in op opposing views towards starting and maintaining dialysis. Why not combining both? Why not, or why not palliative medicine and symptom management be there to extend and expand life instead of saying that this is palliative medicine slash hospice slash let patient die? Why not essentially embark on symptom management to make these patients live longer and to even have longer dialysis free to, free to, uh, freedom and delay dialysis start. Yeah, I completely agree. Often I think there's a bigger focus on symptom management, particularly in palliative care or end-of-life care settings. But I think it's so important across the whole spectrum of chronic kidney disease to look at symptoms. And there's been you know, studies that have shown that symptoms are associated with mortality. So by addressing symptoms, you can also potentially um, address, you know, survival or mortality as well. Great. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, we would like to thank our speakers and thank you very much.